Well, today we're starting a new series called Address the Mess, but before I get into that, something happened Thursday evening in my house that I knew the moment it happened, I would have to work this in. It's going to start sounding like it's a story about my kids, but it's actually a story about me. So Thursday night was my evening off. I was sitting in my living room together with my wife and my three kids, and we're just relaxing, talking. There was a moment of no fighting, which was remarkable. It was just a moment of peace. And then one of my kids, I won't say which one, one of them was looking around the living room, and this child said, this place is a mess. And I think in that moment, it all went so quickly, I think in that moment, my wife and I glanced eyes, you know, we kind of glanced at each other real quickly, and then within the span of about 10 seconds, we gave 20 reasons why this place was a mess, and they all had to do with our children. You see that over there? That's your fault. You see that? That's you. You see that? We told you to pick that up yesterday, and within the span of 20 seconds, or 10 seconds, we had about 20 reasons why this place was a mess, and it had everything to do with them. But here's why the story is about me. While we were going off on our tirade about, and I feel so bad about this as a parent, that was not a proud moment, but as we were going off about why this place was a mess, I noticed on the coffee table was a sweatshirt that I had taken off earlier that day. And I had just thrown it on the coffee table, totally not where it belongs, but as we were going about why this room was a mess, I slowly walked over, picked up the sweatshirt, <laughs> and then I threw it on the kitchen table. As I was thinking about that this week, I was wondering to myself, why is it that we treat messes the way that we do? And first of all, just a kind of a background here, my house really wasn't a mess. <laughs> we keep it to the point where we're not embarrassed if someone walks in. Like, that's kind of our goal throughout the week, unless someone is coming over and we're ready for it. But it wasn't that messy. But I was just thinking about the nature of messes, and sometimes it's like a catastrophic thing that happens. Like, you know, a water line breaks upstairs, or a college student comes home for the summer, and just the house is a mess, you know, and, and it's a catastrophic event. But I think more often, it's just a kind of a gradual piling up of things that we just never take time to address. And as I thought about the messes that are in our lives, I, I was just thinking to myself, like, how do we tend to react to them? And maybe some of you can relate to this, but a lot of times we hide from it, like we hide from the mess. Right now, I'm hiding from my garage. It needs a good six hours of cleaning and sweeping and organizing. I'll get there someday, just th that day has not yet come. But maybe sometimes you hide from a mess or you cover up the mess. Or one thing we're working on in our household is that when you spill something on the counter, don't use Kleenexes to clean it up. Kleenexes don't absorb, they just push the mess around. Like, you can't hide it, you just have to address it. Anyway, sometimes we hide from it, but what we're gonna talk about more today is this second thing that I found myself doing, and I think maybe you have too. We try to assign blame for it. Man, this place is a mess. Yeah, you know why? It's because of you. Man, this, this thing is all messed up, and I think it's easy for us to step into other people's messes and criticize them for how it came to be without even beginning to recognize the messes that we're standing in. And you know why we like to assign blame for the messes? Maybe some of you, this is the only thing you can need to take home with you today because whoever confesses cleans up the messes. If you can assign blame for who made it, they are totally responsible for cleaning it up. And we could end there and say, well, now that we've assigned blame for it, now we've addressed the mess, but it's really more complicated than that. And this is what I've seen in my house, maybe you've seen in yours too, or if you've ever gotten together for like a big family reunion uh, with a lot of people and a lot of kids, you might have noticed this. But kind of what I've observed is that the more people there are, it just multiplies the mess more and more. Like for example, one person leaves out a bowl on the carpet that they shouldn't have left there. That's a mess. But then someone else doesn't know it's there and so they kick it over. That's a bigger mess. And then a third person doesn't know it was kicked over and they walk on it, whatever was in the bowl, and it's an even bigger mess. It's, it's almost like, when we have more people together, the mess just multiplies. I've seen that in my house. Maybe you've seen that in the place where you live or in your family growing up. The more people we have together, the more multiplied this mess is. And here's where we're going with this. If this is true of a household, what about the world? It was good back in the day when we didn't have internet and we had to wait to watch our news at six o'clock or we had to read the newspaper to see what was going on but now with our digital age, we are connected 
with everyone's mess. If someone makes a mess on the other side of the world, we know about it in a matter of seconds or minutes. And there's just so much multiplied mess going on in this world. And I just want to acknowledge that up front is that when it comes to the, the, the way we live in this world, some of us like to keep things neat and tidy and organized, and I get that. But when it comes to the nature of living in this world, this world will unav be unavoidably messy. It's just a nature of sinful people living in a sinful world. We will multiply each other's messes, occasionally pausing, maybe, to clean them up. And this is so true that I, something came to mind this week, and this is kind of like just a weird thing that I, I pursued for a moment and then it passed, but I wanted to bring you in on it too. As I was thinking about this, like the world, I'm, I'm gonna mess this up. The word world is almost synonymous with mess. So whenever you think world, you just think mess. This world is a mess. This world, maybe you might even say, is a hot mess. And so I thought, well, what if we did this with some Bible passages? And this is totally just for fun. This doesn't advance the message at all. But I thought, what if we just took some common Bible passages and exchanged the word world with mess? And it was kind of fun. So I wanted to share this with you today. John 8, 23. Jesus said, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this mess. I am not of this mess. <laughs> Here's another one. Matthew 16, 26. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole mess, yet forfeit their soul? I think this is actually an upgrade from the original. If you just think about what we do to gain messes and then forfeit what's most important. One, one more, one more quick. One. Uh, Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this mess but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What would happen if you went through the whole Bible and just changed the word world for mess? It doesn't work across the board, but a lot of times it gives some clarity as to what was being spoken. <clears throat> now, we looked at these passages, and what I'm basically doing is I'm supplying you with ammunition from the Bible to see the world for what it is. This world is a mess. And so some people in history, and some people today, people like me, that take a hard stand against the world. And instead of addressing the mess around us, what we do is we assign blame for it. In biblical times, there was these people called the Pharisees that were very good at this. And in today's terminology, we even keep that phrase, that, that term Pharisee, even though it doesn't apply to the original people that the Bible talked about. But here's what's true of Pharisees, and I'm not pointing the finger at other people, I'm pointing the finger at myself. Pharisees are really good at pointing out the world's messiness. You know that you've got a mess going on in your life because you did this. Or you know what, if you continue doing this, it's just gonna make a mess. Pharisees are really good at pointing out the messes, not to fix the messes, but basically to absolve them from having to deal with it. This is your mess. This is your doing. Stay away. You, the, you are of this mess. I am not of this mess. We, kind of like we, we draw the line. But here's what's really ironic. Though Pharisees are good at pointing out the world's messiness, they are completely blind to their own. I was reading uh, one book this week called Accidental Pharisees, which is uh, a really good read. I, I encourage you to, to read it. Uh, but it uses this idea of using the Bible like a pair of binoculars. Um, we, we look with really fine-tuned detail into all the lives of the people around us, and we see all their faults and all their messiness, but we can't see what's right underneath us or what's right around us. We use the, the, the Bible, the, the law, as as a pair of binoculars rather than a microscope to look within. So let me just challenge you with one more thing here, one more passage where we're going to exchange the word world for mess, and this will change the way we go forward in this series. This is a common passage, John 3, 16, for God so loved the mess that he did not send his son into this world with a pair of binoculars to point out how messy we all were, he so loved the mess that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then we could have gone on in verse 17. God did not send his son into the mess to condemn the mess, 
but to save the messed up people. It's true, this world is unavoidably messy. And it's true, we can't as individuals or even as a group fix it. But what God has done is he has addressed the world already. He sent his son into the mess to save messed up people. He's already taken care of the world. And when you start to acknowledge and, and realize what Jesus did for the world, it only leaves you with one move left. And that move is not to put on your pair of binoculars and look at all the people around you, but the move is to look inward. Your only move at this point is to address your mess. And there's a caveat to this. You could address other people's messes if they bring you into it. You know, like Christian to Christian, sometimes this happens within our growth groups. People say to you, hey, I'm really in a mess. I'm really in a bind. I messed up. Can, can, you, can you help me navigate through this? Sometimes people invite you into their messes, and it's so amazing how we as a church can do that, navigating each other's messes with grace and truth. But when it comes to your natural stance, you are not here to condemn the world. You're not here to point out the messiness of the world around you and to distance yourself from it. You are here to address the mess within. And that's where we, want, where we want to take you these next uh, at least three weeks in this series is ways to navigate not just the messiness of the world, but really the mess that is inside our own hearts. And I know that when it comes to who we talk to on a weekly basis, a vast majority of the people are are Christians, uh, your Jesus followers, many of you were raised in church or some of you are just getting started, but you're in this place where you kind of know what's going on and you're growing and you're growing. But we might think to ourselves, well, at least we're less messy than the world around us. I, I have to confess, there have been times in my life where I just pause and think to myself, I'm so thankful that I'm not as messed up as some other people are. And in that moment, in that moment, I'm acting as the Pharisee. In just a moment, I want to point out Romans chapter 3 and why that kind of thinking is so, so ridiculous. But first, I want to share with you a short parable that Jesus used to teach people about this very concept. The, the, the story simply goes like this. Jesus said there was two people, a Pharisee and a tax collector, one who was very outwardly clean and the tax collector who was a mess. They both went to the temple to pray. The Pharisee said what we often think. I thank you, God, that I'm not as messed up as the people around me, especially this tax collector. And then the tax collector, as he stood up to pray, he simply said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me, I am a complete mess. And Jesus said, here's the point. In my little story, the one who went away clean before God, clean in God's sight, was not the one who was outwardly righteous. It was not the Pharisee, but the one who went away clean was the one who acknowledged his mess. As it comes to us today, I think we all need to pause and just think about our reaction to the messes in the world around us. Who have you been pointing the finger at? Whether it's an actual pointing of your finger or just an inward judgment. I'm so thankful I'm not as messy as other people. If, if and when that part of you starts to poke up its head, we would do well to take to heart the words of Romans chapter 3. It's in this book of the Bible, this chapter of the Bible, that an apostle named Paul, who actually was a Pharisee, so you know we should take his word for this, he takes us through an assessment of sorts, where we have an opportunity to evaluate what we're really thinking on the inside. And it's really cool because he's actually talking to people who are kind of in the same mindset that we were just talking about. People who were religious and they thought that they had an advantage before God because of their religious nature and because of their background. They figured that of all the people in the world, certainly they were the least messed up. And Paul brings up this hypothetical like, okay, you think you have an advantage? We should talk about this. Romans chapter three, verse nine. Paul said, what should we conclude then? That, that we have any advantage? That just because we have a religious background or just because we know the Bible better than other people that somehow we're less of a mess than the world around us? And he doesn't let the reader linger too long. He goes on very quickly and he says, no. Not at all. We've already concluded that Jews and Gentiles 
alike are all under the power of sin. We've already concluded this, and this is so Paul. Even though he says we've already concluded, concluded this, he continues with 10 verses quoting Old Testament scripture that shows us how horrible we all are. All have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. I decided not to preach on these nine or 10 verses because it would take up a lot of time and I can simply summarize it like this. Whether you're religious or not, you're still in a mess. We're all alike under the power of sin and none of us has any advantage over another. So when it comes to the binoculars that we so often pick up to point out the messiness of the world around us, Paul says you have no right to pick those up. Put it down, put it down, and take a look in the mirror. You feeling good yet? Verse 19, we're gonna skip that section where he quotes a lot. He says, now we know that whatever the law says, law meaning um, basically God says, if you wanna be clean and not messed up, do all these things or don't do all these things. So like the 10 commandments, the moral laws, the ethical laws, there's a big list of things. And Paul says, just summarizing all this with the law, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. And sometimes we use the phrase, you know, oh, you think you're above the law, that the law doesn't apply to you? Paul says, no, the law of God applies to everyone because it's a law over humanity. And deep down, we all recognize there's a right and a wrong. But Paul says it's completely spelled out for us in written word through God's law. Here's what it looks like to love one another. Here's what it looks like to honor God and prioritize him in your life. The law is over everyone. So that, here's the point, not so that you can point out to the world around you how messed up other people are, but the the point is so that every mouth may be silenced. No one may say a thing of judgment against someone else. No one can even speak in their own defense. The law silences the world, and we are all held accountable to God. This world is unavoidably messy, but the problem isn't out there. The problem is in here. No matter how hard I work, no matter how much good I do, I cannot clean up that mess. And that can be a tough pill to swallow, but Paul puts it one more way in verse 20. He says, therefore, no one, no one will be declared clean in God's sight. No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law, by trying hard. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. It's It's an opportunity to look in the mirror and see what's there. And it would be one thing if it was just like the 10 commandments, you know, do not kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal. Those are outward actions that are pretty easy to monitor and conform. But you know what Jesus did? He took those commandments, he took all the rules and regulations that had been passed down through the Israelites and what Jesus did was he took those outward outward obedience laws and he applied them to people's hearts and motivations. So that it's not just an act of murder that's considered murder before God, but it's thinking hateful thoughts that God categorizes as murder. And as you look into this law that judges not just your actions, but gets to the very heart of your soul and your motivations, we are only left with one conclusion. And it's not, man, this world is messed up. But as we see our own thoughts, our own desires, and our own motivations, the conclusion that an honest person should come to is that I am the messiest person I know. I see others based on their outward behavior. I know that they mess up, but I can see the very things that I want to do but never do. And I can see the true motivation for the good things I do that aren't really good on the inside. Everyone should acknowledge I am the messiest person I know. And this is a tough pill to swallow, but what Paul was saying in the first century to religious people is absolutely true of us today. Don't think that your mess don't stink. Your mess is contributing to the world, whether it's multiplied or not. You are part of that problem. Even if it's just a little sweatshirt sitting on a coffee table. But here's the good news. I already showed you John 3.16. 
God so loved this mess that he sent his son into the mess to save messed up people from it. Jesus has already redeemed us from this messiness of a world, and he has promised us that there is a new life that we can start right now, but a new life that will be brought to completion when this world is made new again, without any more messes, without any more sin. We already have our hero who came in to redeem us. And so what I'm asking you to do today is very difficult. It's, it's a lifelong process that can't just easily be done, but it's, it's basically keeping, keeping in mind two important things. Number one, you look in the mirror, and what do you see? A mess. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're a mess. Some of you, you're married, you've been waiting to say that all week. You just didn't have the opportunity. But I want you to be careful with that. You look in the mirror, and you do not tell that person you're a mess. We make mistakes. We make failures. But because God so loved this mess and saved us from it, you are not identified as that anymore. You are sinful but God does not see you as a sinner. He sees you as one who has been forgiven. You create messes in your life. You are not a mess up. You are not identified by the mess because Jesus has redeemed you from it. And so this is so tricky to navigate. But on the one hand, you have to acknowledge the messiness within you, but you have to hold on to the identity of what Jesus won for you, that you have been bought back. You've been cleaned up. You've been saved. So here's my challenge for you. I know it's so easy for us to label ourselves as messy and the people around us too, so here's my challenge for you. Do not label as messy who Jesus has made clean. Maybe that starts with you. But what I also know is that so often what we internalize for ourselves is something that we project to the world around us. Jesus has made you clean. Do not label yourself as messy or messed up. Jesus has declared that this world has been forgiven. Do not label this world as messed up. And to to, to put some handles on this so that we can navigate it this week and do something with it, I have two pieces of application. And then at the end, I'll wrap it up with um, kind of two more specific ones. But the first thing is this. Collectively as a church, I think this is important. This is a message where this fits in. Collectively as a church, what do we do with messed up people? Well, the first thing is, this is a church made up of messed up people because we're all messed up in different ways. But what I want to maybe verbalize for you today is some tension that I felt growing up in the churches I attended. It seemed that there was this unspoken rule that we were so open to people with certain types of messes, but certain types of messes weren't allowed, and you had to clean them up before you were allowed in. What I want to celebrate is that I have not seen that at this church. This is a church where people of all different types of messes can come in and be welcomed and loved and find the forgiveness and the identity that only Jesus can give. We are a church where we bring in messed up people and we declare to them, your sins are forgiven. Now here's what it's like to reflect that forgiveness in your life. So for a church, here's what I want to continue seeing in us is that we are called to love everyone regardless of the type of mess they bring. And I want you to feel comfortable inviting your friends to this place, knowing that we're not going to check them at the door and see what kind of messes they've brought with them in their life. We're going to bring them Jesus. We're going to bring them Jesus like just like we brought you Jesus. He's declared clean. We are not to declare anything messy. And then here's your personal application for this week. So often, what we internalize, we project on the world around us, and maybe you've seen this, sometimes people with messiness that hasn't been addressed is projected into the people around them. So what I want you to do this week is to project the grace that you have received from God himself. Instead of projecting criticism and projecting with your binoculars all the fine details of the messiness of the people around you, would you instead project the grace that you received. And for some of you, the first process is to address your mess with the grace that God has for you so that you can then project it to the world around you. So let's wrap this up. Two other things. Number one, just some questions. What mess have you been hiding this week? 
or this year or since your childhood? What mess have you left unaddressed? And maybe you've been hiding it. Maybe you've been blaming other people for it. But at the very least, at the very least you've just been hiding. You've just been hiding. It's not that you have to confess this to someone, but maybe it's just good to pray about it with God and verbalize it with him. He already knows the mess is there. He wants to use his grace to clean it up. Second thing, have, have you been blaming your mess on someone else? Have you been criticizing others for how messy the house is while all the while you've got a piece of the problem all on your own? Would you own up to that? Maybe, maybe it's, it's a conversation you have this week of acknowledging, you know what? I've been blaming you for this in reality. Here's what I'm responsible for, and I'm sorry. Address the mess. It's unavoidable that this world is going to be filled with messiness, but our only move is to address our own mess. Do not label as messy what God has made clean. And this week, put into practice projecting the grace that has made you who you are. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I think it's easy in a topic like this to feel like we're all alone in the kind of messiness that we've been building up over life. And some of us have a mess that was a catastrophic event, but I think a lot of us, it's just been a gradual piling on of unaddressed issues that have created what we have today. Regardless of where our mess came from, send us away today with the peace of knowing that you so loved us that in spite of our mess, you gave something immensely valuable. You gave your own son to save us from our own mess. You could have assigned the blame to us. You could have just hidden yourself from us, but instead you decided to shine your face on us and to smile upon us by sending us the gift of the only one who could redeem us from this world. Thank you for your grace. Help us put down the binoculars of assigning blame to the messes in this world, but instead hold up before us the mirror that shows us the mess within, but also points us to the one who redeemed us from it. Fill us with your grace this week so that we can find our identity in what Jesus has done for us, and then allow us to reflect that grace to the messed up world around us so that the impact we make would not be through judgment, but rather through love and grace. We pray this knowing you hear and answer us because of the spirit you've placed in us and the son you sent for us. Amen.